Last week, we started a new series of messages that we're calling Afterlife, talking about what happens after we die. And actually, it sounds a little morbid, but if you're a believer in Jesus, there's this great promise, there's this great hope that comes with that. And so last week, we talked about immediate heaven. What happens when a believer in Jesus today dies? What does heaven look like? How does all of that work together? And I would invite you, if you missed that, to go to YouTube and rewatch that or watch that um, for the first time. Today, I want us to fast forward time a little bit to kind of the end of the story where believers actually spend eternity. A lot of people think we spend eternity in immediate heaven or the heaven that is in the clouds, but really there's a def- different place that we actually, as believers, spend eternity forever and ever. So if you're comfortable with it, close your eyes for just a moment. I want you to uh, imagine something with me. I want you to think about the greatest place that you've ever visited. What did it look like? What did it feel like? Maybe there was a breeze, a gentle breeze. Maybe you were with someone significant, but the greatest place you've ever visited. Now I want you to think about the best meal that you've ever eaten. It's probably Mexican, but <laughs> the best meal that you've ever eaten. What, what made it so great? What, what, the, the texture, the taste, the, the smells. What made it so Amazing. How about the most peaceful you've ever felt? Like what was, what was going on? Who was with you? How did that feel? How about the most joyous time in your life where you were overwhelmed with joy? Maybe it was when your child was born. Maybe it was on your wedding day. Maybe it was when your child moved out. The most joyous day of your life. Now, I want you to imagine multiplying that times infinity and it lasting for eternity. That's the place that followers of Jesus will experience at the place that I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about the new creation, the new heaven, the new earth, and the new Jerusalem. If you're taking notes, I told you last week this is a great series. If you're not a note taker, to start being a note taker. If you're a note taker already, you're going to love it. But here's my title. You can write this at the top of your page. Heaven on earth. Heaven on earth. I want us to fast forward this morning to the end of the Bible. All of the end time events have have happened, which is eschatology. That's the study of the end times. All of those end time events has happened. Christ has returned. And a lot of times that's where believers like to start a debate, right? There's debate in Christian circles about how those end time events will happen, how they'll line up. Is it literal thousand years? Is it literal seven years? Are we living in part of it now? We, we really like to debate some of those details, but the fact is, is that the Bible is just not extremely clear on any of that. You can have your opinion, you can have your belief, but the Bible's not extremely clear on any of it, but what the Bible is clear on is that at the end of the day, we as believers have an enormous and amazing eternity to look forward to. The Bible is clear that evil is defeated at the end of the day and that Satan and his tail are kicked in the lake of fire and evil no longer reigns and exists. That right there is enough to get us excited. So how's it going to happen? I got to be honest, I don't exactly know. But what I do know is that I'm not worried about it because I have an eternal home to look forward to on a new earth and evil no longer, pain no longer, hurt no longer exists. So I'm not going to dive deep into those end time events except for to say that where we are in the story today, the tribulation is over, the thousand year reign of Christ is Complete final judgments taking place, and Satan has been thrown into the lake of fire. And then we see this new heaven and new earth. Now, there is some debate when we say new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem. Like, what does that word new mean? Some people would say that that means that this earth that we lived, live on is done away with, and God provides a completely new earth, and he kind of does it over again. I think God certainly has the ability to do that, wouldn't you? 
But there's another school of thought that thinks, well, no, it's not like there's a new, a different earth. It's just that God has, has redeemed the current earth. And so he's renewed it, not created a new one. And I have to say, that's the that's the belief that I would have because I'm thankful that I serve a God who doesn't scrap old dusty stuff but redeems and restores it, aren't you? That just because it wasn't the way he wanted it, that he doesn't scrap it, he redeems and restores it. So I believe that this new earth that we will be on will be the same earth. It'll just be renewed and redeemed for his glory. Regardless, there's a new heaven and a new earth. And this is the eternal place for us who have surrendered our lives to Christ. Those who are in the immediate heaven are moved to this eternal heaven on earth. And as we look at this, I want you to keep in mind that like, we're going to be physical beings on this new earth. We're not going to be babies in diapers. We're not going to be angels. We're not going to be ghosts, but we will be physical beings on this new earth. How do, how do I know? Well, some of the verses that I'm about to read, I think, indicate that. But also, do you remember after Jesus was resurrected, he was a physical being. He appeared to many. He was a physical being. And so at the resurrection, we will be physical beings. What will our bodies look like? I'm not sure, but I know they're going to be perfected. And let me just say, I like to think that a perfect body has some love handles. Can I get an amen? I don't think we're going to have chiseled abs. I don't think any of that. I think we're going to have a little meat on our bones. I'm not exactly sure what it's going to look like, but I'm going to believe that I already have the perfect body because that's what it's going to that's what it's going to look like. It's going to look similar to the body that we have today. And not only that, but we'll be physical beings and we'll do a lot of the same stuff that we do today. We'll eat, we'll laugh, we'll play, we'll have fun. Now, before I dive into the details of this new heaven and this new earth, and we're getting to the, to, to the Bible, you're like, where's the Bible? It's coming. There's a lot of it. But before we get into the details, if you're a person who's been following Jesus and you've been in church a while, I, I want to offer this don't discount what I'm saying because you've been led to believe something else. Just because you heard it on a TikTok video does not make it true. You see, one of, the, one of the mistakes we as believers often make is we will try to use the Bible to confirm what we already believed rather than using the Bible to develop our beliefs. And so if maybe I say something and you're like, I don't think it's like that. I heard so-and-so when I Googled it just be patient, just consider that what I'm saying may be, may be true. If you don't have a church background, if you're even um, a little undecided on this whole Jesus thing, what I would ask you is don't dismiss this because it sounds too good to be true. Because the fact is, is that millions of people, myself included, believe that this is true. This is the final home for those who love Jesus, I believe it's true that God was willing, is willing to go to these links to spend eternity with the people that he loves. Why? Because throughout the course of Scripture, throughout the course of history, we see God trying to get a solid and perfect relationship with his people. Remember back in Genesis when Adam and Eve sinned? They broke communion. They broke fellowship with God. What did he do? He covered their shame. The Israelites, they're in slavery in Egypt. He wanted them to be free to worship him because he wanted his people back. What did he do? He set them free. And then Jesus stepped onto earth, died on a cross, rose from the dead. Why? Because God loves people and God wants a relationship forever with us. And so this is not too good to be true. It is the culmination. It is the grand finale of the entire story. So don't, don't cut me off. My goal is to make this extremely understandable no matter where you come from. We're going to be looking at parts of Revelation 21, Revelation 22. It's really easy to find in the Bible. Just flip to the back. It's almost at the end. Revelation 21, Revelation 22. Just to give this a little context, this is the Apostle John who writes the book of Revelation. He writes it because he gets a vision while he's exiled on an island called Patmos. Now, he gets this vision, and he begins to try to write it down. And the reason why he's writing the book of Revelation is to encourage the persecuted churches of the time. And to say, listen, there is a prize awaiting you if you will keep the faith and you will hang in there. There is a prize awaiting you. 
And so he, he writes this to encourage them. And I just find it interesting that he writes the book of Revelation to encourage some believers. But throughout the last few hundred years, we have used Revelation to debate other believers. Or to even scare people. John, the reason why he's pinning these words, it's not to scare anybody. It's not to debate anybody. It's not to confuse anybody. No, it's to encourage churches and say, listen, if you will stick with it, there is a prize awaiting. And that is a word for some of us today. Listen, if you will stick with it, there is a prize awaiting. I know it's difficult now, but there is a prize awaiting us. So as we read this, keep in mind the book of Revelation can't be taken completely literal. Because what John is seeing He is trying his best to articulate as he writes these words, but he's a human himself. And so he has limited language to use to paint the picture of what's going to happen. So let's dive in. Starting in Revelation 21, verse 15, it says, The angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city. Its gates and its walls, the city was laid out like a square as long as it was wide. He measured the city with a rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length. I'll translate that in just a minute. And as wide and as high as it is long. The angel measured the wall using human measurement, and it was 144 cubits thick. The wall was made of jasper. And the city of pure gold is pure as glass. The foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. So I want us to look at three things that are going to be new in this new earth. Number one is we'll have a new home. A new Jerusalem, that's the place that John is describing there in Revelation 21. It's where believers will be. It's where it's the holy city. It's the capital city, and it's literally where the presence of God will be. He will literally reign in this new Jerusalem, and it's huge. The city walls by feet would be 216 feet thick, 1,400 square miles which would be the largest city ever constructed, if you put it on a map of the U.S., or if you put it on top of the U.S., it would stretch from New York City roughly to Dallas, Texas. And it's huge, and it's, it's beautiful. It's made of every kind of precious gemstone. All, you can imagine, they're all shimmering as they catch the light from the glory of God who reigns over it. And the walls are made of jasper. Now, I think it's interesting that our jasper, most of it's red, right? But yet it says that it's crystal clear. So I'm just asking, maybe John, this is one of those times where John was using the best words that he could possibly muster. But could it be that these walls are actually made of diamonds? Could it be that amazing? I think it, I think it, could, and this entire city is lit by the glory of God. That's how, that's how glorious, that's how perfect, that's how revered he is, and the city is made of pure gold. I heard a preacher joke while preparing for this. Y'all want to hear it? All right, you're going to hear it anyway, because this is in my notes. Um, And if y'all don't like it, I'm not going to be offended, because it's not my joke. Anyway, so this rich man dies and goes to heaven, and he takes all of the gold that he bought while he was on the earth. When he got there, he was so proud, and he showed it to St. Peter. Now, I don't know why all of these heaven jokes always have Peter involved. Do you ever notice that? Like, why can't we throw Matthew in there? But he shows it to St. Peter. Peter sees the gold and says, why did you bring pavement to heaven? That's the joke. But the point is, i got to pick myself back up after that. <laughs> Sometimes you got to cheer for yourself, y'all, and I'm just kidding. <laughs> but the point is, is that's, that's how amazing it is. And it's all for believers to experience for eternity, to walk down the gold streets on a beautiful day, or to see the jasper or the diamonds or whatever they are as you're going to have a meal, and to experience the light of God 24 Seven. If you're a believer in Jesus, that's the place that Jesus is talking about in John 14, 2, a passage we often read at funerals, but it says, Jesus talking, my father's house has many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to there to prepare a place 
for you. If you're a believer in Jesus, there is a condo with your name on it. Prepared and ready for when this day comes. For you to experience all of that. The second thing we'll experience is a new family. This doesn't come directly from the book of Revelation, but I think it's really important because as I was, as I was thinking about this, I know that some of you have drawn the short straw when it came to your earthly family. I was trying to think, do I need to acknowledge the woo? Um, but you really, you really have. Maybe, maybe it started at a young age and you were abandoned or you were abused. Maybe you've gone through a marriage or marriage is and you've never, you've never felt loved. You've never felt cared for. Maybe you, maybe you never knew your father. You never knew your mother or you always felt rejected. Well, the beautiful thing about this is we'll all be, be family. I want you to see that one day you won't experience that kind of family. You will experience a, 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 a perfect family. There's a story in the book of Matthew, if you may remember it, where Jesus is teaching and some people come and get him and they say, hey, your mom and your brothers are outside waiting. And Jesus responds to him and says, who is my mother and who are my brothers? Pointing to his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. We'll have a new family. We'll all be family. We'll get along. We won't hurt each other. We'll have intimate relationships. We'll know each other well. We'll have perfect communication. Of course, the question is, like, what language will we speak? Right? Have you ever thought about that? The answer is, I don't know. But some scholars believe that we'll speak the same language we speak now, but we'll be able to understand all the others. Remember, there's some precedent in Scripture for that. Remember Pentecost in, in Acts, when the Holy Spirit comes upon the people, they begin speaking in different languages, but it says that they can understand everybody. So it may be that we still speak Southern English, we still speak Greer, we still speak Blue Ridge, but everybody will be, will be able to understand you. If you're from up north, you'll be able to understand us. We'll all live in this understanding and We'll all be family. And this is why I think it's important that if you don't like certain groups of people, whether it's based off the color of their skin, whether it's based off of where they came from, or I'm going to say it again, how they vote, you better get used to it because you're not just going to be tolerating them in heaven. They are going to be your family if they're a believer in Jesus. And that's, that's, that's why we never just want to be a, a, a white church or a church for X, a X kind of people. No, we want to be a church for everybody because we are all family. And one of these days, we're going to be blood family because we're going to be reunited with Jesus. So what does this mean for our earthly family? Well, we'll be family too. Like, I, I really do believe that you'll know your family. You'll know that you were family on earth. But the Bible does shed some light on the marriage relationship. Matthew twenty two thirty. 30, this is Jesus talking. It says, he says, at the resurrection, people would neither marry nor be given in marriage. They would be like the angels in heaven. Some of you are like, woo, finally out of this one. But <laughs> don't laugh if you're sitting beside them. But for others of you, doesn't that kind of break your heart? Like every time Melissa and I talk about this, it kind of breaks our heart. She's like, I still want to be married. I'm like, that's what the Bible says, baby. I can't do anything about it. But, but here's, here's why. Because the marriage relationship was, was put there because Adam was lonely, remember? And so the marriage relationship was kind of a, a, a placeholder. Remember, we're the bride of Christ as the church. And so the marriage relationship was put there as, as a placeholder. And the beauty of this is that when we get to this place, this new earth, this new Jerusalem, we are going to be in such community with Christ that we will no longer need that placeholder of marriage. If your spouse has a relationship with Jesus, they will be there too. And I believe you'll probably know that you were married on earth. But now we're in perfect, perfect community with the only one who can truly satisfy our loneliness. Now, some of you think, that doesn't make sense. And the truth is, is that some of this stuff we cannot comprehend. 
We have finite minds. I heard a, a pastor say it like this. They said, let's say that a little girl for a birthday wants to have the best day ever. And so she goes out, she buys a bunch of candy, she buys some baby dolls, she has so many toys. She comes home, she eats the candy, she plays with the baby dolls, she plays with the toys. Well, the next week, her parent says, you know, I had the best day ever today. And the little girl looks at him and says, well, how much candy did you eat? Do, do you see what I'm saying? Like, we don't, have, we don't have the capability of fully understanding this because of our immature, immature minds. But I'm telling you, anything that we can understand, it's going to be better. Here's the third new thing, a new reality. Two verses, two sections of Scripture I want to read here, and then we'll talk about it. Revelation 21, starting in verse 3, says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. And he will dwell with them. They will be his people. And God himself will be with them and be their God. That's the way he wanted it from the beginning. Verse 4, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning, no more crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. Then Revelation 22, starting in verse 3, says, No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. Did you catch all the no mores in there? No more death, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more curse, no more night, no more tears. You see, while we are on planet Earth, sin is the problem. The breaking of God's law, and not just his laws to keep control, but his laws because it's the best for us. The sin is the problem. And since the very beginning, Genesis 3, sin has continued to wreak havoc on the world. When Adam and Eve fell, when they took the fruit off the tree that they weren't supposed to take, even though they had the entire garden, how much is that like us? Like, you can have all this. No, I want that. But that's what they did. They, they took that fruit, and since then, man's not only falling, not only are we sinful, but the entire world fell. And the entire world was off balance because something that was foreign that wasn't supposed to be there entered it. And so now sin is the cause of, of death and pain and sickness and abandonment and addiction and divorce and natural disasters. All of that is caused by sin. But when we get this new reality, we will experience a new earth without the problems that sin causes. And it's not just like God is going to wipe away sin, but he's going to flood the earth with good. He's not just getting rid of bad, but he's putting all of the good in it. It's, he's not, it's like he's not just cleaning out the refrigerator. He is restocking the thing with everything you want. And this, the entire earth will be void of the presence of evil and sin will be full of the presence of good because God is good. It's a new reality. Because of that, age will no longer take a toll on us. Holla! Once again, I don't know what those perfected bodies are going to look like. I'm just praying there's a little fat on them. We'll work, but it won't be painful. Remember, work preceded the fall. Adam and Eve had a job to do before they ate of the fruit. So work was never meant to be a punishment. It was meant to be something that will fulfill us. We will work. And we'll do many of the same things on this new earth that we do today. We'll experience entertainment. I really hope there's football and baseball. Although I have been thinking about it, and one team has to lose. Otherwise, it's what fun is it? And so how is that going to work? But I'm pretty sure it's going to make it happen. We'll, be, we'll eat. We'll play. We'll laugh. We'll sing. We'll dance. Like I said last week, I'm pretty sure I'm going to be able to sing in this new earth. But did you notice Revelation 21, 4, it says that he'll wipe away every tear from their eye. I want to address that because most people are like, wait, there's no, there's no tears in heaven. Like Eric Clapton taught us that, right? <laughs> some of y'all get that, some of you don't. That's okay. Well, here's the, here's the deal. After, after the judgment, I think we will have a reason for some tears. Just 
Just imagine, imagine being in the fullness of Jesus, seeing the scars in his hands, what he went through for you and for me, and also knowing that I lived my life for such temporary things. Can't you imagine there'll be a little bit of reason for sadness and tears? When you realize, you know what, I, 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 I was so petty. I chased so many of the wrong things. And then you see your Savior ready to embrace you, and you see him in his physical fullness. I think there'll be a reason for some tears, but then God will step in. And he'll wipe away every tear from our eye as we look into his glory and the fullness of of what he has for us. So what does all this mean for us today? It means that we have some amazing hope. That's, that's what I want you to get from this. Like, I don't want to just give you information, but I want you to see the amazing hope that you have through a relationship with Jesus. In fact, 1 Peter 1.3, this should give you some hope. It says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ in his great mercy. He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. And here's what I want you to hear me say today because I know that some of you brought in some heavy stuff. You have been through some heavy stuff you have experienced some heavy pain. What I want you to hear me say today is that this is the thing to hold on to. If you ask me, why should I continue going? Sometimes when people ask a pastor that question, I feel like I should have an answer. I don't because I don't understand your pain either. I don't understand why you have to go through that. But what I do know is that we have an eternal hope beyond what we can see, beyond what we can comprehend. And so why should you hold on to faith today? Why should you keep going? Why should you not give up? Why should you not throw in the towel? Why should you not stop coming to church? Why should you not stop believing? Because we have an eternal hope. And it is in not this world, y'all. This is so short. It's so minute. It's so tiny. We have a hope in eternity, eternity in heaven and eternity on a new earth surrounded and full of the presence of God. That that is what you hold on to when you got nothing left. Believe it. Hold on to it. God is faithful. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to give someone a chance to respond to Jesus. Because I would love to tell you that everyone gets to experience this, but that's not the truth. You see, that sin that I talked about keeps us from having a relationship with God without giving our lives to Jesus. These promises are only for those of us who have placed our faith in Jesus. And the Bible says that it's kind of simple. That you admit that you're a sinner. That you believe Jesus is the Savior. And then that you confess him as Lord. It's not just a prayer, y'all. It's, it's a walking with him. It's a turning your life from the things you used to go to back to him because you know what he has is better. If you need to accept Christ this morning and you feel that tug in your heart and in your gut, you can just say this prayer. It's not about the prayer. It's more about the belief and the confession. Just say, Jesus, I surrender. I know I'm a sinner. I know I've missed the mark. But I believe you're the answer. I want the eternal hope to live forever with you. So I place my trust in you. I know I'm not going to be perfect, but I'm going to do my best to follow you. God, I thank you for, for hope. I thank you for the heaven that's going to be on the earth. And God, until we get there, I pray that you would help for us to live lives on this earth as, as foreigners. And 
not to not to think this is all there is, but one day we will be home and we will be in your fullness and see your glory face to face. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.